Okay. Hello, everyone. How are you? How was your day? We are sorry for the quite long delay. We had a lot of technical difficulties involved with the projector mostly. So, can you scan that, please? Did everyone scan it? Anybody still waiting? Then let's see how's it going. OK, interesting results. I did expect, expect the vast majority to be Windows. We do have quite a bit more Linux than I thought in an introduction to Linux rule. I was expecting way more Mac OS. In that case, let's go back to the slides for a second. And let's see. So the first discussion doesn't, I guess, make that much sense anymore. But what is Linux? Do we have any answer to that? Anybody want to take a guess on what Linux is? For now, I will take the liberty of saying the fact that Linux is an operating system, like Windows, like Mac OS. We'll get a little bit more into why that's maybe not quite accurate, but let's say it's an operating system. Then the question becomes, right? If Linux is just an operating system, and I assume everyone in this room probably already has an operating system, be it Windows, be it Mac OS, what makes Linux a bit special? Well, first of all, we can look at it from the point of programmers, where while Linux usually has a pretty small percentage of usage when it comes to desktop computers, it's somewhere below 3%, if I remember correctly. When it comes to professional programmers, the usage of Linux goes up to 40-something percent. So it is significantly more used. Now, the reasons for that are mainly due to the fact that, first of all, just a lot of servers run Linux. And then when you're going to want to develop something from that, like for a server, it tends to be easier to develop on the platform that you are developing for. Now, another thing would be accessibility. We'll go into this more in just a little bit. But compared to Windows, you can extend a lot of things on Linux. You can change a lot of things about it. And that tends to help with a lot of programming workflows. And also just general stuff like installing programming tools, installing IDs, installing language supports, tends to be a lot easier in Linux. And then as a follow-up, kind of related to extensibility, you can also sort of extend it yourself. Linux is way more open than Windows would be, for example. So in theory, if you are a programmer, a programmer that knows how to do this in particular, you can kind of make Linux do just about whatever you want it to do. So that's like from the programmer point of view. If any of you have more feedback on that, but I would say those are some of the main points why programmers tend to use Linux. Now, from the point of view of someone who's not a programmer, it just tends to be fast. So Windows, Windows does a lot. Windows does a lot all of the time. There is Windows Defender in the background doing a lot of things at any given time. The desktop environment as a whole is doing a lot in Windows. And you have a lot of processes running in the background. Windows, I think, can take like 2 gigabytes of memory by itself or something like that. It can take a lot of memory and a lot of just compute time to run. While a Linux install, while it differs from Linux to Linux, it would generally only take maybe 300 megabytes or so of memory to run it. So it can way easier run on way lower hardware. That's the main point here. And even on, on high-end hardware, you would still get some performance impact, but it tends to be a little more negligible. The other thing would be privacy. Generally speaking, you don't really find Linux distributions that are going to do a lot of tracking. While when it comes to Windows, if you've been through the install process of Windows 11, I think you go through like six or seven pages of just disabling telemetry. And by disabling it, I mean setting it to required instead of all, which still doesn't disable much. So privacy is another concern. And the final one is just it's not Windows. As you tend to use Windows, in my experience at least, and I've had this experience with more people, 
As you tend to use Windows over the years and you tend to install more applications, especially if you want to tinker with your operating system a bit, it ends up breaking at some point, and every once in a while you just kind of have to reinstall your Windows. It tends to not be very stable. Stability, you could say, is another great point for Linux. But now is the question that I accidentally spoiled a bit earlier. What is an operating system? Or what do we mean here by an operating system? Does anyone from computer architecture want to take a guess? Well, it's a program that okay. describes how the hardware components should behave. OK. How the processes should be handled. OK, so a program that, hand, a program that handles hardware handles processes, what else? And that gives the user an interface to, the to what the components can do. And gives the user an interface, okay, anything else? Okay, so you take this answer, you give it in a computer architecture class to Mr. Chira, Mr. Chira says congratulations, you get a 10. It is a correct answer. It is very much correct. However, that's maybe not all that we mean here by operating system. And when we talk in natural language about operating systems, if you install Windows, right? Is this all that Windows does? No. It also gives you a pack of programs that you can use. It gives you a big pack of programs. And now some of these programs, you could uh, argue, are basic utilities, like maybe you would kind of need a text editor, for example. You would need a file explorer because you need a way to manage your files. Sure. But then also, yeah, it comes with Candy Crush sometimes. And I don't think that's necessarily part of our standard definition of an operating system, right? And so let's talk a bit about what we mean by operating system when we talk about them on a day-to-day -day basis. So. I'm kind of going to split it up into four main components. First of all, one of you, I don't remember who, said it manages the hardware. That's a correct point, and that would be, generally speaking, interacting with the hardware would be the job of the kernel. That would be one part of it. The kernel would give programs that are running, or processes that are running, it would give them an interface to be able to interact with real hardware. So that is both the CPU, in terms of CPU scheduling, it is also the memory because that's one thing that wasn't mentioned, but it also handles memory management. Now, on top of the kernel, we have the actual programs that are running. So already, I would say that the operating system is maybe a collection of software, not necessarily just one program. Now, over it, I would call some stuff essential programs. So if you have a kernel, processes can interact with the hardware, sure. But by the general definition, on, even like the formal definition of an operating system, would be that it, gives, uh, it allows interaction between the user and the hardware. So by just making the connection between the hardware and programs, we've kind of went halfway. We have half of the connection. But now we need some essential programs that actually allow the user to see what it's doing. So that would be having a way to send commands in the system. It would also include some basic file management stuff. Generally speaking here, though, I don't mean a full-blown file manager, like a UI, a user interface of a file manager that you can see. I just mean that through some magic text commands, you should be able to navigate through your hard disk, create files, delete files. That is required, generally speaking, to have a general purpose operating system, at least. Same with like text editing. You should have a way to edit files as well. Now, on top of that, modern operating systems will have a GUI, a graphical user interface. Uh, part of this is going to be giving us access to those essential programs in a graphical way. So this is where Notepad on Windows comes in. You have a graphical way of editing text files. This is where the file manager, the file explorer comes in. And a lot of programs like this, I, they would be fairly essential GUI programs. And then over top of that, you have what I will just call the bundled apps. And what that is will heavily depend on the operating system, 
but generally speaking, these are non-essential. You can 100% have an operating system without these. This would be, for example, Microsoft pre-installing Office Suite. They could pre-install it. It would be a decently good bundled app, but you don't need the Office Suite to have a computer. So that's why I call these bundle apps on tops, right? Now, here we already kind of have the very first and very important difference in how we think between Windows, Mac OS, and then on the other hand, we have Linux. And that would be just the modularity that it provides. So when you install something like Windows or Mac OS, you get all of this at once. You get a whole bunch of bundle software. You have the GUI, the user interface and stuff, and you cannot change any of that. In the user interface, maybe you can move where the taskbar is, you can change your wallpaper, you can change some colors, but you cannot change the user interface. You cannot say, I want to have a new program that handles my taskbar now. For the taskbar, you can do some hacks, but like generally speaking, you can't. In Windows and Mac OS, those are built in and locked into the operating system. Linux, by the name, would technically just mean the kernel. Linux by itself is just a kernel. It is a way for programs to interact with the hardware, and it provides nothing on top. You cannot directly, as the user, interact with Linux. Now, generally speaking, what we're going to refer to today as Linux would be GNU Linux, which is going to be a combination between the G G uh, GNU core utilities and Linux. Those are going to provide us a part of the essential programs that we need, enough to be considered a full operating system. Now, the thing is, I don't think anybody wants to use just this. If you would have to somehow figure out yourself how to install everything on top of this from scratch, there's a thing called Linux from scratch. There's a project that you can do if you have a lot of free days and not a lot of fun stuff to do around. But generally speaking, we would still kind of like to have the full experience when we install the operating system. At this point, that's where some other programmers have done our jobs. So there are programmers, or teams of programmers, or in quite a few cases, companies, that take the job of pre-installing you a GUI, pre-installing you some bundled apps, making sure that everything works together, and providing you a way to further install new apps in the future. We'll talk about how that works in a second. When you have all of that together, then you have a distribution, or generally speaking in the world of Linux, called distros. There are a bunch of companies that do this. I don't know the stats right now, but I think there are over 6,000 distributions or something. There are a lot of distributions, but most people are going to use the top five of them, top 10 of them or something. There are some that are very popular. Who here has heard of Ubuntu in the past? That's going to be almost everyone who here has heard of Arch. That's going to be a little bit less people, but still almost everyone. So there are some very big distributions that kind of everyone knows and uses. So those are going to still provide us with the full experience, the same way that Windows and Mac OS did. The difference, though, is that none of this is locked in. Even if you've installed a certain distribution that has shipped you, its UI and everything, and the way it looks, and the programs that are pre-installed. You can delete anything, and you can replace anything you want with anything you want. Nothing is locked in. At a certain level, you can even go all the way back and replace your kernel, because there are a couple different versions of the Linux kernel. So that's generally speaking what I mean by modularity. When you install a distribution, you will still get everything at once, the same way you would with Windows and with Mac OS, but you can swap out anything you want. You're not locked into what you downloaded. OK, so let's see. Another big difference is the fact that Linux is open source. And generally speaking, any distribution, not generally speaking, I'm pretty sure any distribution over Linux is going to be open source. Does anyone know what open source means? Yeah? yeah the code is publicly available. And 
as long as you respect the license. Yeah, exactly. So there are a lot of open source licenses. The most important thing that it means is that, yeah, the code is open. Everyone can see the code. Generally speaking, with most licenses, people are all, you're also going to have contributors. So people are going to see what you did in your code, say, hey, I don't really like how you did this. And they're going to, in some way, suggest to you, do you want to change it with this new code I wrote? And then they become a contributor. So with that, we kind of get, I think it's the first one I wrote. Yeah, so the first thing that I wrote is that the code is inspectable, so we can see the code. This is the most important thing for the privacy part that we talked about. Because when Microsoft tells you that they're not spying on you, to a certain extent, you are just trusting Microsoft. Because they can be just, fingers crossed, I swear I'm not spying. Now, if Linux says they're not spying, you open the code and you check, is it spying? Generally, it's probably not, but you can check the code. So that's the point of inspectability. You can check if anything malicious is happening. You can check if your privacy is being invaded or anything like that. The second thing, it is community driven. So while the Linux kernel for the most part, not as much, generally distributions are not built by one person. It happens in some small cases for some maybe small niche distributions. But big distributions like Ubuntu is developed by both Canonical, a company, a real software company that is behind it, as well as, I don't know, but probably thousands of contributors. So there are a lot of people in the world that have worked on this. There are a couple of reasons why this is important. A really good one is you kind of get a bit of assurance that the code is probably decent quality. Because when you're working at a proprietary company, right, if you have a code source that will never be visible, and you're working eight hours a day, and you're getting paid maybe a little less than you want to be paid, you write whatever you need to write to accomplish the task. And what you wrote may be very stupid. But your manager is not going to care, and the people aren't going to see it, so you're not going to care. And you see this a lot with a lot of proprietary software when eventually, for some reason, their code gets leaked, sometimes it's really bad code. <laughs> that, I guess, is not the end of the world. It is the end of your memory, though, if that thing gives you a memory leak or something. So with a community-driven code, generally speaking, if someone decides to be lazy and write some bad code, someone else is going to see that bad code. And they're not going to like it. So that code is probably eventually going to be fixed. That is kind of the promise of the fact that it's community driven. Finally, we have the fact that it cannot necessarily disappear in the same proprietary software can. So if Microsoft came out today and we said, I don't want to do Windows anymore, because they got bored, then we no longer get any Windows updates in the future, right? And that's probably not going to be a problem for a while. You're probably not even going to notice it. But if you look maybe five years down the line, 10 years down the line, it's no longer going to support newer hardware. It is completely going to stop functioning on new systems. Now, if Canonical decides, hey, I no longer want to work on Ubuntu, I want to cancel this project, a little fun fact about open source licenses is that, generally speaking, you can take open source code and you can fork it. What it means to fork a code, imagine like a crossroad, where you say, I'm going to take all of the code you did up until this point, but now I'm going to update it myself. I will go on a different path now. So if any open source, and this doesn't have to be an operating system, if an open source project, project, a program or something, stops being updated, and if there's interest in it, someone will probably pick it up. And they will continue updating it. So you're kind of ensured that if your software is wanted, it will keep being updated. People will update it. If it actually dies down, then there was probably not much need for it. In that case, yeah, sure. That's a little different. OK. Another thing is the software as in the programs that you can install on the operating system. 
So those are, first of all, the software selection, that is just gonna depend on any operating system. You cannot install the same things on Windows as you can on Mac OS. Now, there are a lot of applications that you can install on both, because the developer has released packages for both Windows and Mac OS and Linux, but there's no guarantee for that. So there's not a lot of, like there's a lot of software that can only work on one or two operating systems, not on all of them. Now, when it comes to Linux, your actual pool of software selection, all of the software that you have, is actually quite huge. I think it's bigger than Windows, if I know correctly. There's a lot of stuff you can install. But there's also a lot of stuff on Windows that you cannot install on Linux. As a general rule of thumb, quite a few proprietary software tend to not really care about working on Linux, and especially stuff that is very business oriented. So the Microsoft Office Suite is not a thing on Linux. You can get another Office Suite, just not the Microsoft one. Um, any sort of Adobe apps are completely out of view. As a matter of fact, most types of animation apps are out of view. But that's just when it comes to proprietary apps. On Linux, you get a huge pool of mostly open source software. Side effect of that, a huge pool of mostly free software. Because open source software doesn't really tend to be paid. It's really hard to charge for a software when the code is public. People can just download it and run it. It's not particularly hard. So generally speaking, you know, in the open source world, people will then sell you services on top of it. So they would say, hey, I'm giving you this app for free, but I will give you high quality support, high priority support, if you pay me a bit. So you would try to like, find other ways to monetize your app other than selling the app itself. Another point is how you install that software once you found it, right? So, let's go through how we install a software on Windows, right? And I will pretend to install, what did I do? I think I did OBS. It's an application for uh, recording videos. And this is how you would install it on Windows, okay? So, I open Firefox, or your browser of choice, you search for OBS, try to find which of the link is the correct one, Click on it, you go to the download page, it gives you a file, you run the file, it opens the installer, you click next, you click next, you, you definitely read through the terms of service, through all of it, all the time, click next, you choose where you want to install it, you click next, you wait for it to install, you click finish once more, and you have OBS. Does that seem like a normal install procedure on Windows? I think everyone has gone through these exact steps quite a lot of times. So that was 10 steps and at least three what I would consider quite critical security flaws. So first of all, I looked up OBS Studio. What if I went to the wrong link? Now for OBS Studio, it's a big software, sure. Hard to miss it. But if you try to install a small software, there's a bit of hunting it down and 10 websites distributing it and try to figure out which one of them is not malware. So that would be the first problem. Second of all, I go to the correct website, I download the file, how do I know that that file is what I wanted? What if the website itself was hacked? What if on their servers, the executable was replaced? Do I have a way of knowing that? No, not really. In some cases, packages can be signed. Almost nobody signs their packages, so people are used to clicking the ignore button. And so that's not a valid defense to this. The third point, the actual installer that I run, what did that installer do? Whatever it wanted, realistically speaking. In this case, it installed OBS. If it wanted to, it could have installed a bunch of stuff in the background. I wouldn't know. So those would be, I would say, the three pretty big security issues you have when you kind of install anything on Windows. And now, I, didn't, I don't have screenshots for macOS 
because I don't have any macOS devices that I can take screenshots on, but I have installed something on macOS and I remember it being another magical process where you have to find the file in a similar way, you open the installer, you have to do some dragging thingies, I think. I haven't installed on macOS in a long time, but as far as I know, it's a decently similar pro uh, process to what Windows does. So, let's install OBS again on Linux, right? Now, this is going to depend a little bit on our distribution, and we'll talk about why in a second. But let's install it on Ubuntu. So, I'm going to open up the App Store, let's call it, not the Apple App Store, the Ubuntu App Store. It's called Ubuntu Software in this case. I'm going to search for OBS. I'm going to click that Install button to the right. I don't know if that's visible to you, but there's an Install button. And OBS. So that was three steps, and not a lot that could have gone wrong. So addressing the couple things in the past. What if I clicked on the wrong OBS? Well, your package managers, your um, distribution in this case, actually, would be the ones that are giving you that package. And they're not going to give you 10 OBSs. They're going to give you one. And they're going to check that that's the correct one. Again, you, here you're not necessarily trusting one person. You're trusting the contributors. There's a lot of people that look at this. Second of all, the other problem we talked about of, OK, I downloaded it, but did I download the correct thing? Yes, because it checks that. So in this case, after downloading the file, it will check that the file is the correct one signed by the distributor. And that cannot be bypassed. Well, it can, but you shouldn't. And the third one of what it does, uh, that's once again handled by the distribution. That uh, nobody can alter what the installer does. The installer just does what the distribution wanted it to. Install that one application. So that kind of fixes those things up a bit. Does this flow of installing apps seem familiar to anything we're used to? The Play Store. That's mobile devices. That's just how you tend to install stuff on mobile devices. If you're on an Android phone, you open your Google Play, you find the app, you install it. If you're on the App Store, same thing. And you are, to a certain extent, given kind of the same guarantees of security. Because before putting an app on the Play Store, Google will check that app is safe. Will it always do a great job? It will sure try. Maybe not always, but it will try. So there's a similar thing here. By the way, an alternative to all of these steps that we just did in the past, right? Just run one command. <laughs> We'll go a bit into, how, into like using Linux with commands, not today, in one of the next meetings. But once you do get more used to Linux and you start using the command line, and especially if you start knowing the names of these packages, which tend to be intuitive, OBS Studio is OBS-Studio. Once you know that, you don't even have to open the App Store and look for it and stuff. You just type this, and everything else just happens. It installs it for you automatically. Now, what this command means piece by piece, we'll go into that a bit later. OK, so once you install a distribution, the first thing that you're going to see is going to be the user interface. Not only a distribution, that's also for Windows, that's also for Mac OS. When you install an operating system, you're going to see how it looks, first of all. And now for Linux, you have a lot of ways that it can look. This is, not, this is very different from Windows and Mac OS, where every Windows is going to look the same. Every Mac OS is going to look the same. When it comes to Linux, you have a lot of what's called desktop environments. And in some cases, you don't even need a desktop environment. A desktop environment is the combination of the entire interface that you see in Windows. And there's a lot happening there. There's a process that has to set your background. There's a process that has to start your little taskbar at the bottom of your screen. There's a separate process that has to start your app menu. There are a lot of things happening in the bottom right where you can control your networking, you can control your uh, display brightness, your sound volume. Those are a lot of apps, but all together they make this one big interface called the desktop environment. On Linux, you have a lot of them. For Ubuntu, the default would be GNOME. You have KDE, you have a bunch of them. I left some screenshots in there. What you will notice is that some of them are very much based on looks. They try to look really clean or look really good or look like macOS. That also happens sometimes. 
Other ones of them, like LXQT, will look a bit more dated, maybe, a little bit older. But these, and same with XFC, are also in even lighter on memory. So this would run very well on like all laptops or something like that. So these are the first thing you see when you install a distribution. Ironically, these don't really matter. Because once you have installed a distribution, as we said, everything is modular. If you've installed a distribution and it came with GNOME, and you decide that you don't like it anymore, uninstall it, install Plasma, install whatever. You can switch out anything at any time. So choosing your distribution based on just how it's going to look, maybe not the best idea. You can kind of change that at any time. Then the thing that would be more important about the distribution is how you're going to get your packages, how you're going to get your programs. So I said that the distribution has two main roles. It's going to, first of all, bundle everything together so that you get a nice install with everything out of the box. And then it's going to also give you a way to install more stuff over it, right? Generally speaking, they would do this through some type of repositories. This is in the same way that Google needs to have some server <coughs> to store all of the apps on the Google Play Store. In the same way, any distribution will have their repositories where they sell, where they, uh, they don't sell them, but they store the apps that they've packaged. Now, there are, I would say, <coughs> three main ways of installing an application and anything. What I've shown you just before, that was using the repository that was specific to our distribution that we chose. So I'm calling them distro repositories. I wrote some example of the distribution and the package manager that it uses. I'll go into what the package manager is in just like 30 seconds or so. But each of these will have their own repositories. What that means is from distribution to distribution, different software might be available that is maybe not available on other distributions. Or a newer software of a version might be available that is not maybe available on other distributions, right? So depending on which distribution you choose to trust, maybe the most important thing would be what packages you're going to get. This only applies to what software you can install using the package manager. In reality, any Linux software can work on any Linux distribution, as long as you compile it yourself. Now, main difference here would be most distributions, I think, I would say, uh, sort of like Ubuntu, are what's called a scheduled release. So in every April, I think, you get a new release of Ubuntu, and then in every October. October. And then at those points, all of the packages are going to be up to date. And you, well, almost up to date, at least. You're going to get new and fresh packages. The reason it takes them some time to do this, and they do this twice a year, is because during that time, they have to curate the, those packages. They have to find them, they have to package them, they have to make sure that they're safe because they are providing those guarantees to you. So that takes a bit of time. And they choose to release them in batches. Some do it quarterly, some do it every half a year, some do it every year. This is depending. Other distributions are what would be called rolling release. That means that you will always get the newest packages. As soon as, a new pack, as soon as an application is updated, some contributor of the distribution will look at it and publish it straight out after doing some checks to make sure that it's stable. Generally speaking, advantages would be that with the rolling release, you always have the newest stuff. That's good. Disadvantages, you don't have the guarantee that everything works together. So if Ubuntu does this every half a year, they can make sure that not only each software works correctly, but the software that they are releasing in a batch is functional together. Everything is compatible with each other. A rolling release distro cannot necessarily make this claim, because maybe something will update and something else needs the old version. The other thing breaks. So. Advantages and disadvantages to anything. 
Another thing are these general repositories. I don't know if there's a name for them, I'm gonna call them general repositories. What that means is that these are repositories that you can use on any distributions you are. These, <laughs> Snapcraft, we don't talk about it. Flathub Flat, Flat has a lot of packages. Um, and again, these you can install on any distribution. Again, advantages to these, it also tends to be the developer themselves uploading directly. So you can make sure that you're getting direct experience. There are still some security guarantees, but that's not as important. The third thing is, you know how on Windows as well, you can have portable applications. You don't necessarily have to install everything. Same thing is here, true here as well. And then you can also have this mixture of app images. An app image is a file that you download. It is one file. You have to search for it on the internet the same way you would in Windows. So those problems come crawling back. There's not, a, there's not a central repository. You have to find the app image yourself. But once you have it, you double click it, the app opens. And everything works. So that's app images in general. Now, uh, let's finally talk about the reason I said Ubuntu apt, for example. The three main components here, right, would be the repository, the package format, and the package manager. So going from right to left, the package manager is actually what is going to install your application. So you press the install button, someone has to install it for you. And they have to figure out also everything else that's needed. Maybe what you want to install depends on something else. They have to install that as well. That is the job of the package manager. What it installs is the package format. So that is the actual distribution. How do they store their files, basically? It's like a, not necessarily like a file extension, but we can think of it in that way. And then finally, the repository itself. That is the software collection that is specific to the repository. The reason I'm separating them in this way is because in a lot of cases, there will be multiple distributions that will use the same package format and the same package manager. So they will only change the actual repository. The reason why this is is because a lot of distributions are actually not fully original. They're based on each other. Uh, has anyone heard of Linux Mint? One person. So Linux Mint is based on Ubuntu. Ubuntu is based on Debian. So you have this nice chain of things happening, and all of them use the deb package format because they are based on Debian. OK, that's not that important. Now, the final thing which I wanted to do today, and I have to check if I still have time. I do still have half an hour. Do I have half an hour? How much time do I have left? Pretty much? OK. So the final thing that I want to run you through is actually installing an operating system. Because I have made a video about this in the past for those of you that are from uh, computer science in English year one. So for those that are my classmates, I've made a video about installing the, uh, uh, Linux in a virtual machine. But this time we will do it on an actual laptop. That's also why this took so long to prepare because this, yeah? Uh, yeah, you can turn off the light for now, I think. Thank you. OK, so the first step, which is the only step that I will also be skipping today, is that you have to grab what is called, uh, you have to grab an installation media. So who here has actually just installed an operating system in the past? Anything, Windows. That's quite a few people. So you're kind of familiar with how this works. You grab an installer for, media that's, for Windows that's the media creation tool or just the ISO file itself. You somehow write that to a USB stick. There's a lot of resources online about this. That's not something that's related to Linux, so that's not why I'm covering it. But you write it to a disk. You write it to a, yeah, a disk or a USB. And that is going to be what you install Linux from. So. The first thing, let's make sure, uh, can we turn the lights back on for a bit actually? Because I realized that this is not gonna be visible without it. This is not gonna be visible without the lights. This setup here. Yeah, yeah that's a bit of a problem. So 
for now, because uh, I cannot put any of this on a projector because there's no HDMI output. That was why this entire setup here exists with the two laptops. Uh, what we have sort of done is, will this work? It will work. Cool. I think I should turn the back on. Uh, there is a chance that you should. Can I just, can I turn the brightness down on this? Can I have that? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Let's see about this. Let's see how it works, right? Okay. So, I will just plug the USB stick into my computer. And then when you turn on the computer, you want to get into your firmware settings. And it's gonna beep sometimes. Anyone been into the BIOS before? Yeah, now we should turn it off. Yeah, 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 now it's fine. I will also hold this a bit higher because otherwise I'm not gonna see. So, has anybody been, I'm gonna focus it, right? Yeah. Has anybody been into the BIOS before? Yeah. So, I'm not gonna go a lot through this, but you just wanna make sure that the USB that you're installing from is selected to actually boot from it. So when this computer is now gonna turn on, even if it has an operating system installed, which this one does actually, it's not gonna power on that operating system. Something wrong? That's it all? Thank you. So it's instead gonna open whatever is on that USB, right? So let's see that. Cool, so in my case I have multiple operating systems but that doesn't matter. If you would have just Ubuntu on it, right? This is what you would see when you boot up your computer. Now, is the text kind of readable? Maybe you can get this a bit closer. The idea is the options are not, no, let's put it further away. The options are not anything scary or weird. It's not Chinese, it's not Russian. It says, try or install Ubuntu, which kind of seems like what we want to do. So we'll do that. Now, just to get it out of the way, you will see a bunch of times, including now, the term. I'm waiting for it to happen. Yeah, you will see Kabuntu with a K before it. That's not just to make it sound cooler. Uh, Ubuntu actually distributes you multiple flavors. It's the same operating system with different uh, desktop environments over it. Ooh, it did a little disco light. <laughs> I don't know why it did that, but that also doesn't matter. So, after a bit of time, by the way, Linux is not generally that slow. This laptop was just bought by uh, sorting from cheapest to most expensive. And so this will maybe take a little bit. You think it extended screens? Well, if it extended screens, that should be good, because then we should be able, I think, to see it here. Yeah, it extended screens. OK, that's fine. So we can now see it up there. That's easier. Hmm? Yeah, sure, I will. Thank you. OK. So, um, who, so some people here have said they installed operating systems in the past. Who installed Windows in the past? A lot of people, actually. Uh, who installed Linux in the past? Why are you not in introductory to Linux cores? For a long time. Yeah, for a long time. OK. So one of the differences, you know how when you install Windows, you just get sort of a full screen installer. You don't get to really do anything. You just go next, 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 next. And then you sign into a Microsoft account because they no longer allow you to not do that. And then eventually you have Windows, right? For Linux, for most distributions, the thing that you can do is click Try. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna cook up my laptop a little bit because it's cheap. But after it's done cooking up my laptop, we'll see that it actually loads the desktop environment. So this is what would be called a live environment. This is a full Linux. 
We can play in here, whatever we want. Mirror the screen, yeah, thank you. So this is a uh, run now, straight from the USB stick. Now the one thing is, obviously whatever, um, whatever changes I make in here, right, those are not gonna persist. If you reinstall, you, if you reboot your computer, you will lose everything. Does it mirror now? Yeah, it mirrors, okay. So, as I said, you can in here open your file manager. This looks sort of familiar to Windows. We can manage all of our files in here. Now again, if I write a file in here and I restart my computer, that file will be gone. That's not actually being saved right now because we haven't installed it yet. So you can think of this as sort of a, a quick trial of the operating system. Now, uh, in order to actually install it, I would like to connect to the internet. Will I be able to? Well, that is for UVT to tell me because sometimes Edurom doesn't necessarily tend to work. This, generally speaking, shouldn't be that complicated, but it's Edurom, which is complicated. But if I am a little bit lucky here, please work. There's also a 50% chance that I put my password wrong, by the way. So that might also happen. Oh, it worked, cool. So now we can see that we have this program here called Install Kubuntu. So let's go through that and let's see how difficult is it gonna be, right? So, it's gonna choose our language. That's simple enough. We click next. It's gonna wanna know how our keyboard works. The default one is correct for this laptop. And also, this will generally check your laptop or computer or anything. So as long as things work properly, this should just be configured automatically. You can just click continue. Uh, for some reason, this one allows me to choose between a normal installation and quitting, I guess. There's no other option. I don't know why that button is there, but there is a button there for that. And now we will download updates while installing. Sure, as it just says, this saves time after installation. That sounds good, I like saving time, so we'll do that. And then the other one is install third-party software for graphics and Wi-Fi hardware. I want Wi-Fi hardware, I have Wi-Fi hardware, I want it to work, and so we'll click that as well, okay? It's then gonna ask us to wait for a moment Okay, and it's then gonna ask us, where do we wanna install it? So, as you can see, all of these are guided, which sounds cool. We like being guided through stuff. And in this case, I wanted to use an entire disk. Here is a very, very important thing. This is like, this is the only moment in this entire process where you can mess stuff up. Select the correct hard drive. How did that happen? Oh wait, this one had problems, cool. That was unexpected. Works? Works, cool. So, if you click on the wrong hard drive, it will delete absolutely everything off of it. So this doesn't just delete enough so that it can install itself. Because I have told it use entire disk, it will just delete everything that is on that disk. And what you'll be left with is the operating system and a whole bunch of empty space probably. So I will click on the correct one here and we'll go install now. It will once again ask me to confirm. Now the text is a bit small for you to see in the room, sadly, but it is just giving, my, giving me a short summary of everything that we did. Importantly, it's gonna tell me that a certain partition is gonna be deleted. So it's gonna delete my data. It's asking me once again, am I sure? And I am sure and I will click continue. Okay, now it's asking me where I'm from. Almost, I'm from Romania. And then you set it up the same way you would with 
well, with old Windows, when you used to be able to like put your username and stuff and not have to sign into Microsoft. And so I will be called your notes for the purposes of this meeting. And you get to choose a password. Now, how long does it need to be? Different distributions will actually have some requirements. Uh, this one, I think, has none requirements. So that's not important. And then you can just name your computer. So naming your computer, that's only important really if you want to be able to like find it on a network, for example. That's what it's going to be identified. Well, not identified by, but that's what's going to be like publicly visible as, right? OK. So we're going to click Continue. And that's it. That was the process. And now we just have to wait a bit for it. So who thinks that was complicated? It's. I would argue that installing Linux is about as complicated as installing a Windows app. You have an installer. It asks you everything in plain English very nicely. Now, don't get me wrong. Linux will be as easy and as hard as you want it to be. It is your choice. We are installing here Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a very well-known distribution, especially used by beginners or in education because of the nature of how incredibly guided it is. Everything is kind of spoon-fed to you. If you want to like have more control and see what you're doing, you have levels of this. You can go to the point where you are fully compiling your operating system from scratch. So you can get this to be extremely hard of yourself if you really have an ungodly amount of time left and really no idea what you'd have to do with it. Or you can make it easy. Or you can go in the middle if you want to be able to customize some stuff, but not waste like 20% of your life or so. So this is now going to take a little bit. In the meantime, do we have any questions? Do we have any feedback? Do we have any corrections on what I said? especially from the back. Nothing? Then I ask a question. Are you interested in Linux? Is it interesting? No. Cool. Does that make sense? Yes. I haven't even booted it yet. I guess it would make sense I guess we're having a starting point here where we're not particularly interested in Linux because I've told you some general things of how it can be good, right? I've told you that it can have great tooling for developers and you can extend it. But I also haven't shown you any of this. I'm basically just here saying Linux good, like Linux. So I don't blame anyone for not being interested in it yet. But I need to have this sort of uh, theoretical introduction a bit, kind of mostly to know what you're getting yourself into. Because what kind of happens a lot is people can install Linux or in a virtual machine or anything, and they can just expect it to work the same way Windows does. Or expect it to not shut off when you're talking. So if you have expectations like this, you're going to be quite sad at the end of the day. Because Linux is not going to end up working like Windows. And in reality, if you are a big fan of Windows, if you can't wait to get home and open up your Windows and stare at your Windows, maybe you're not going to enjoy Linux a lot. But giving it a shot is always an option. <laughs> and especially as programmers and as people, so who here studies computer science, everyone? Wait, OK, uh, let's do it the other way. Who here doesn't study computer science? That makes more sense. We have two people that don't study computer science. Out of curiosity, what do you study? Or, I have studied. Yeah, you have studied. I know you. You don't study anymore, you? <laughs> Topography. Topography. OK. With, at UVT? No. Not at UVT. OK, got it. So for those of you that are in computer science, which is basically everyone, I'm sort of giving you here a very soft introduction into Linux. 
before, I think, year two, where we have the operating systems course, and you will get a very tough introduction into Linux, where you will get to know exactly... You basically be expected to kind of know Linux, uh, how it works generally. Yeah. Because in like one or two weeks uh, after the course started, uh, the teacher is going to deep dive into programming the Linux kernel and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So right now I'm giving you this sort of general idea because it would be kind of maybe good for you to get a little bit familiar with it. Because when we do get to dive into it in school, we will dive head first. So we will at some point get to know exactly what the kernel is, there will not be the magic numbers of kernel and essential software. We'll get to know exactly what it is. But that's going to be tough if you haven't even used it at least a bit in the past. Also, we've already seen from semester one, um, who here is not from computer, architect uh, computer science in English year one? So who here is not in the same class as me? Quite a few. Uh, have you done computer architecture with Mr. Chira? You've done it with a different person. So for those in my year who've done computer architecture with Mr. Chira, and specifically who've done the computer architecture labs with Phineas, you will know that Linux was already quite useful when it comes to it. So over time, some of you will get to actually enjoy Linux as your desktop, because if you like it, no reason not to use it. Those of you that will not enjoy it as your main desktop, you will not run from it. You will still get to use it for school, probably for work in the future. If you have to manage a server at any point, good chances that's going to be Linux. Virtual machines, you're going to have to do a lot of Linux. So. As a general idea, first of all, try to see it in my beautiful and embellished way. Because you will see the dark sides a bit later. OK? Have I yapped enough? Do I need to do more yapping? I still have like 5%. I ran out of topics to talk about. Well, what about how bad Windows is? Have you guys? Uh... <laughs> ever installed an app and it installed like Bing bars. And, uh, <laughs> okay, I have a story regarding that. So, uh, okay, for first of all, a quick check. Everyone knows what Microsoft Bing is? Yeah. It's their search engine. Anybody know, uh, who knows what, what was it called? Bing bar or something? Microsoft Bing bar? Yeah, or app. Yeah, or something so like that. Search bars. Yeah, there's an app that you can have that basically just put the Bing search over your wallpaper so that you can always access the dear Bing, right? Uh, who here knows what DirectX is or has heard of it? A lot of people have heard of it. So generally speaking, on Windows, you will need DirectX to run most games. I'm not going to go into what it is. It's a graphics library. But basically, it's a way that games will interact with your graphics card in particular. There's also drivers and stuff, but generally speaking, it's a framework for that to happen. Generally speaking, who here has installed DirectX, like manually, searched for DirectX and installed it? That's already more people than I expected, because up until maybe one month ago, I've never installed DirectX directly. You would usually just maybe install a Steam game, and it will install DirectX for you, or you will install some, like, a game from the Xbox app, if anybody uses it. I don't think so. And again, it installs it for you. But recently, I had to install DirectX manually. And the beauty of installing Windows apps that Alex was talking about struck me when I was going through the installer, going next, 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 like, like the old register lady that just goes, uh, 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 right? That's Windows. You just go next, next, next. And then I almost went next over a step that read optional. Do you want to install Bing Bar along your DirectX? Because Microsoft, and why not install anything? And if you install anything, there's a 50% chance you get Bing. 
So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. OK, we're done. I have yapped enough. Thank you. So now, if we go in here and we click restart, maybe I should, uh, for a second, switch to this again for a second, just so that we can actually see what's going to happen. Right? So we're going to restart this now, because we've installed it. We're going to wait for it, because my computer is fried. OK. And then at some point, it's going to tell us, very kindly, please remove the installation media and press Enter. Because if you remember when we did the priority, if we now just let it, don't do that. If we now just let it power on again, it's going to boot from the USB again. We don't want that. So now if we press Enter, We see the beautiful Lenovo screen. We then, with most distributions, you will see some magic text. This one just hides the magic text which, with a very nice Lenovo picture with some abstract lines. And that's it. And now, if we hopefully, please tell me this is going to work, it will. We're now back to where we just were, right? We have access to. Plasma. But this time, this is fully installed. So now, if you create files, if you install programs, if you do anything, that's all going to persist. You now have it installed the same way you did Windows. Yeah, merge the screens. OK. So first question, right? Does this look kind of similar to Windows? You got to answer vocally, because I'm not looking. It could be way more different. It could be way more different. So I intentionally chose this desktop environment here called Plasma. Did I merge them? Please tell me I did. Yeah, I did. Because Plasma kind of has the layout of Windows. So it looks a bit different, right? But also, I'm talking about Windows 10, not Windows 11. Windows 11 is weird. But when it comes to Windows 10, in the bottom right, you have about the same things you would in Windows with your quick settings. I can click on them. Yeah, with your quick settings here, with your Wi-Fi, with your uh, time and everything. And in the left side, we have an application launcher which looks similar to the Windows 7 application launcher, I guess. Not really the Windows 10 one, but still. Again, anything can be customized. So at this point, the final thing that I want to highlight for today, because we are running out of time, is that for basic usage, this is not very different from Windows. If you want to do anything that you would do in your browser, you want to look at some YouTube, you want to watch some Netflix, you want to talk with your friends on WhatsApp, right? You have Firefox pre-installed, and you can install any other browser you want. And realistically, once you open an app, right, and you have it full screen, now I would argue it looks a lot like Windows. because. Generally speaking, when you are on computer, when you are on your computer, 90% of the time you're not going to stare at your desktop environment and go, "Ooh, that's so beautiful." You're going to open an app and you're going to work in the app. So for most basic usage, you don't really have to think about the fact that you are using Ubuntu. So I, you can open the browser, do whatever you want. The file manager once again looks decently similar to the Windows one. I don't have any videos or photos or anything because this is a brand new install. But if you had anything, it would just work out of the box. Double click on an image, it would open. Stuff like that just works. The one thing, again, that we talked that would be different is if you want to install an app, generally speaking, you open up the App Store. So this is the thing that I showed in the thing in the demo a bit earlier. 
So if I want to get Krita, for example, which Krita is a drawing application mostly, you can just go on it, you can click install. Is it going to be? OK. It's going to ask you for your password. Now, uh, Windows doesn't usually ask you for a password when you're installing your app. But if you think about it, it does do something quite similar, which is you would usually be popped up with that administrator thing, and you have to click yes. This is the same thing, actually. That's why it's asking it, because it wants administrator rights, pseudo rights on Linux. We'll talk about that later. But it needs those rights to be able to install properly. The difference is on Linux, you actually have to give your password to give those rights. You can't just say yes. And now, I don't know if it installed. Yeah, it's like 99%. But that's it. And now you've installed Quita. And just like in Windows, you can go to your Start menu. You can search for Krita. And again, once you have an app and you open it, you don't really need to think about the fact that you're in Linux anymore. Because you have your app, you full screen it, and you get to work. So that's the main thing that I wanted to hopefully get across today. That Linux is not the scary hacker movie operating system. In reality, once you have it installed, it's 90% the same experience as any other desktop, any Windows, any Mac OS. Fundamentally, they all just run apps. Thank you. That's our time. Any questions? Why it turned off? That's a good question. Yeah? What's next? So, yeah. Let's talk a bit of general information. I'm not sure what Mr. Chira already told you because I had to step out for a second. But these meetings, the UVT meetups meetings, will happen, uh, Phineas, I think for the entire semester, right? Yeah, so they will be for the entire semester. I don't know if the schedule is available yet. The schedule is not yet available, so we'll get that later with time. For the first three weeks, I can say that it will be me doing this introduction to Linux thingy meetings. And then it's going to be multiple other people going to more advanced and in-depth topics. That's why I'm sort of laying the groundwork here. Um, What's next particularly for my part of this, for Linux? Uh, we're still working out the details, but generally speaking, the second meeting is going to focus around actually using Linux. M mostly, like 90% still in this GUI. So trying to make it uh, not, not similar to Windows, but looking at it from a common user perspective, where I don't want to write commands for everything. I just want to click buttons, and I want stuff to work. That's going to be our main focus for the, ne for the next meeting. We're going to be doing a lot of stuff just by clicking buttons. We will also be getting Windows apps to work on Linux. Now, that is hit or miss. Not all Windows apps will work on Windows. But there are ways to get quite a few of them working. So we'll look into that as well next time. And then two weeks from now is going to be the most advanced one, because that will be the terminal one. So in, yeah. so in, uh, three, in two weeks, I guess it would be, yeah. In two weeks, we will be looking at doing stuff in the terminal. So managing your files in the terminal, managing network in the terminal, creating files, editing text files, whatever I can think about in two weeks from now. So that would be the general schedule. Any other questions? Then thank you everyone for coming, thank and that was it for today.